Very good afternoon to all of you. The chairperson, the executive council of SLMA, members of SLMA, dear invitees, guests, and colleagues, friends. My name is Madhu Disanayaka. I'm the assistant representative of UNFPA, and I'm the moderator for this session. If you had been with us uh, from morning, then I'm sure you are aware of UNFPA's partnership with SLMA and the session that uh, was conducted previously. But for those of you who have joined just now, just letting you know that this is an extension of the previous session, which started at 10.30, and it's, uh, this one is mainly looking at inequities and challenges to reach gender equality in emergencies. Before I begin, uh, to introduce our eminent speaker for the session in order to set the tone, let me make a few minutes uh, by adding a few points which are taken from a paper published by someone called Dr. Judith Rodin. Some of you may have heard of her. She is regarded as an innovator, change maker, thought leader, the first woman to lead an Ivy League institution in US and former president of the Rockefeller Foundation. She did this uh, paper in partnership with a gentleman called Robert Garris, uh, who was also the managing director of Rockefeller Foundation. It starts like this. It's called Reconsidering Resilience for the 21st Century. I thought of mentioning this because this was done several years ago, but it talks of our new normal today, more or less. So the point number one, we live in a world of increasing dynamism and volatility, where technology and greater interconnectedness have accelerated change and altered the way people live. Since the 1970s, the world population has grown by 75%. People around the world have become much more connected in many ways. Last year, about half of the world's countries reported cell phone penetration over 100% in the next 40 years, the planet will host more people who will be more connected physically and technologically than ever before. They'll be distributed around the world in new ways. Point number two, vulnerability and resilience indices will allow us to make more informed choices about where to target interventions. Focusing on vulnerable groups and communities and gearing support to build their adaptive capacity the World Development Reports in 2012 focus on gender, for example, begins build an evidence base for understanding the complex impl implications of gender for vulnerability. The different ways in which women, men, boys and girls experience and respond to shocks and to design interventions that build resilience. Point number three. Although the large institutions of the development and philanthropic world do not experience the same types of vulnerabilities as communities which they work, we risk failure, irrelevance, or creating harm if we do not cultivate processes to evaluate, learn, and adapt, creating institutional resilience to changing global and local environment. Last point. We must constantly take in new information and alter our approaches correspondingly, adjusting and transforming strategy and programs in response to changing conditions. The ability of development organizations to work closely with vulnerable communities and groups and implement the lessons of resilience thinking so richly informed from fields as diverse as engineering, psychology, ecology, will determine our success in addressing the critical challenges of the 21st century. It's, um, I don't know whether it's a dichotomy that uh, um, I said something that was taken from a US doctor and now I am going to ask uh, another US-based uh, professor to explain how she feels the new normal, how things are working, what are the challenges that she sees in responding to new normal and in during emergencies. So let me move into introducing Professor Liesl Neidegger. Uh, Dr. Liesl Neidegger is, a, is an assistant professor in health behavior and health education and director of the Gender Health Equity Lab at 
the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Neidegger earned her PhD in Health Promotion Sciences with a concentration in global health and her master's in public health from Claremont Graduate University, School of Community and Global Health. In 2015, Dr. Neidegger was awarded a two-year postdoctoral research fellowship at the Center for AIDS Intervention Research at the Medical College of Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Dr. Neidegger was awarded a Fulbright Fogarty Fellowship in 2012-2013 that took place in Durban, South Africa. Dr. Neidegger's research interests focus on sexual health, equity among vulnerable and underserved populations. Since we have a very short time to discuss so many aspects, I would like to ask Dr. Liesl Neidegger to provide her remarks initially, and then we will have a few questions uh, posed by me, um, and then if there are uh, enough, if there's enough time, we will move on to the audience for their questions. Over to you, Dr. Liesl. Thank you all so much. Um, it is such an honor to be here, and um, or I guess virtually, um, and thank you, SLMA, um, for the invite. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. I'll provide some background with um, some of the work that I've done and some examples from the research that I've done, and then we'll kind of get into what this means in today's world. So, let's see, I'm just sharing the screen here. So uh, this is a quote that I think speaks to um, the paper that was just read about resilience. Um, one participant is an African-American woman here, and I'm sure um, it's probably made news of the racial issues in the US. And she said, oh, to be a black woman, not to be a statistic, not to just succumb to whatever they think you are because you are a black woman. The loud obnoxious got seven or eight different baby daddies on welfare. It's about strength. I feel like we're more empowered. I feel like I am the expletive as a black woman because I've overcome a lot of stereotypes and statistics on both sides of being black and a woman. And I think that's really important and powerful because of the, it sh goes to show um, the intersectionality here of you know, gender-based violence and equity in, and in health and uh, she sees strength in that. Let's see if I could, there we go. So addressing gender and health requires understanding and appreciation of sexuality, of gender roles and power when designing services. And to do this, we, we have to have valid data. I know that was, that's was that been mentioned several times already. It is so important. Um, but given the sensitivity of these topics, um, such as gender health or uh, gender-based violence, it remains a global problem that must be overcome if we're actually going to achieve gender equity. Violence is rooted in discrimination and inequity that is upheld by individual attitudes, beliefs, practices, and politics as we've seen before, as or heard it before. So I want to, um, oops, here we go. Um, I want to show um, just when we're talking about gender, we're not necessarily talking about just male or female. Uh, somebody that who identifies as cisgender, their gender as they, uh, as they identify is the same as the gender that they were assigned as birth. So that's somebody that's cisgender. Transgender is somebody that identifies as a gender different than what they were assigned at birth. Then we have uh, gender fluid and, um, Okay, um, and uh, gender fluid, and that um, that's somebody that might go between male and female over time. It could be a week, it could be um, it could be a month, it could be a year, um, but they kind of go between both. And then non-binary and gender queer, sometimes they're used um, interchangeably, but basically it's somebody that kind of falls in the spectrum and doesn't really identify strongly as male or female or maybe a little bit of, uh, of both. And so we need to look at this as more of a spectrum. And so when I'm talking about gender, I'm talking about um, all of these because um, there's an equity issue here. Okay. Oops. Okay, so um, I, my, 
Am I sharing my screen? Okay. Um, so I really quickly wanted to go over what types of gender-based violence um, that come to mind. So what do you think of, uh, what forms of violence are included in gender-based violence? Um, and you can maybe put it in the chat if you don't mind sharing what um, first comes to mind when you hear that. <laughs> okay, so um, a lot of people just, um, yeah, a lot of people uh, don't, uh, they think immediately of domestic violence. And so this is usually physical or sexual violence. Um, there's also sexual assault. Um, and this is, you know, rape, un non-consensual, unwanted uh, sexual contact. And then there's also trafficking that's included in uh, gender-based violence. So this is you know, modern day slavery. But another, a couple other types that we don't necessarily think of with uh, gender-based violence is forced early marriage. Uh, so this is when at least one party is under the age of 18 and one or both parties do not really fully consent and really want to get married. And then there's also female genital mutilation. And this is the partial or total removal of external female genitalia or other in injury uh, for non-medical reasons. Okay, so I wanted to share just a couple examples of, um, of some of the work that I've done. And so this is um, a Hispanic woman and she was with an abusive man for quite some time. She said, I feel like a monster because I stayed with him. Um, you're justifying that man's behavior, like against your kids, you're defending him. Another one, um, she would try to refuse a condom, but then finally stopped because her husband would uh, would beat her. So she stopped asking that just um, so she, she would stay safe um, and would not be abused. He also refused to let her be on birth control and she eventually got the, the implant um, because he wouldn't allow her to have the, the, the IUD. Uh, this woman, I, I'm not gonna read it because it's a long one, um, but she was molested, she was sexually abused as a child, she was physically abused as her mother by her mother, and then she turned to you know drugs to cope with everything. Um, she turned to prostitution. And so we can kind of see what what happens when things like this uh, occur. And this uh, woman, oh, I shouldn't say, 34, she was 24. Uh, she was actually being abused by her father and ran to her boyfriend and, um, and he was physically abusive. Let's see. Okay. Um, so just really briefly, prevalence, it is uh, one in three women experience physical or sexual domestic violence. 7% sexual, uh, sexual violence from a non-partner, and it's probably grossly underreported. 28 girls every minute are wed under the age of 18, and 200 girls experience female genital mutilation. Domestic violence also occurs in same-sex relationships, and there's a lot of stigma there uh, because when you're thinking about, let's say, two women, and there is domestic violence, the stigma and some of the connotation that comes from it is, well, they're not as strong, so the violence must not be as bad. If it's two men, then, you know, it's just boys being boys. They're just having a fight and, you know, they'll get through it. And we need to look at that as also uh, gender-based violence and partner violence. So, um, so gender-based violence is higher during emergencies. So while some emergencies um, immediately affect more men, for example, more men were uh, in most countries contracted COVID-19 at higher rates than women, but immediate and long-term consequences of emergencies disproportionately affect women and other um, in gender minorities. Emergencies increase uh, gender-based violence, a specific, especially domestic violence. And emergencies also lead to decreased access of quality healthcare services and reproductive health care. So when we see emergencies, there's less access to contraception and increased in uh, maternal mortality. 
So an example here is the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. There we saw a really dramatic increase of sexual violence and exploitation during that time. So let's talk about COVID-19. So sheltering in place, which you know most countries have done, um, maybe not ours so well, but um, has further increased domestic violence around the world because women and girls are literally trapped with their abusers and have less access to um, probably already limited resources. So the increased number of women calling helplines in parts of Asia, North and Latin America, Europe, it's, it's all been increased uh, quite substantially. In Tunisia, actually, within the first few days of their shelter in place, their calls increased uh, fivefold, uh, five times just in those few days. And, and the reason that a lot of this happens is because stress increases uh, violence. And so households uh, are experiencing financial strain and unemployment and loss of income with everything going on with, with COVID right now. Um, and so that can increase the stress. So what, what, what are some of the barriers to actually trying to decrease um, gender-based violence or increase disclosure? Well, there's stigma of reporting. So this leads to very limited data. Only 40% of women who experience gender-based violence seek help. And most of that is not to like a formal mechanism. It's not to a doctor, it's not to the police. It's usually to a friend or family member. And the reason is because of fear and shame and retaliation um, and, or just a lack of knowledge of the resources of how to access help. In many countries for a variety of different reasons, um, every time somebody goes to a service provider they might have a different healthcare um, provider. So they might not have a primary care doctor. Um, here in the US, it's, be, it's often because um, of being a very low income and you're not gonna go to a primary, you're maybe gonna go to the ER or an urgent care. Um, in other countries, it has to do with how the, how the healthcare system is, is set up and just go and see whoever's available. So there's a, different reasons, but this happens worldwide. Uh, sometimes service providers or medical um, professionals excuse the husband's behavior, like, well, you, you shouldn't have set him off. Um, uh, sometimes they can't provide the services that are needed and they have to refer out. And the more, the more referrals and the more work that has to be done on, the, on behalf of the survivor um, or by the survivor uh, decreases the likelihood of um, seeking support. Obviously, we've seen limited services during COVID and other emergencies um, because they have to shut down. So in the UK, for example, um, they had the services that provided help for gender-based violence reduced by 76% um, in how they were serving the front lines. So with that, um, I will turn it back over and see if you had um, questions for me. I didn't wanna uh, take up too much time uh, with, you know, just going over this kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liesel. I think um, I would like to pose a few questions, um, keeping a little bit of time uh, for audience questions if there are any um, urgent questions. But I would like to ask you, uh, in terms of because uh, the audience is predominantly medical professionals, we know that uh, others also have joined in. Uh, how do medical professionals um, help to mitigate uh, the so-called gender-based violence? And within that, I also would like to know uh, the fact that people don't disclose physical or sexual violence in, in a situation like that, because uh, the, the issue for us sometimes is where are the data? And uh, constantly when you are being challenged that your data doesn't provide enough to say that this is a larger issue, although you said and we say one in every three uh, women have been uh, subjected to violence or abuse, still I think there is this uh, misnomer around many professionals that it doesn't occur. So in a situation like that, what are the indicators that one, one should look at as a professional and or look for and ask for? So if you could uh, sort of provide us a little, um, uh, your, your understanding on that, over. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So we often think of violence as 
physical and sexual violence, but if a partner, um, and, it, and it doesn't matter, you know, what gender each one is, um, if they're using intimidation, um, they punch a wall, they um, break your phone, they're using um, psychological abuse, like making you think that um, you're crazy and that's called gaslighting, um, using isolation. So obviously there's a lot of isolation going on right now, but if a partner isolates them from reaching out to family or friends, um, somebody might not be able to help them get out um, or keeps them like, you can't be friends with males. Um, it's not that I don't trust you, I don't trust them. That's a very common line. Um, minimizing things, using economic abuse, um, so preventing somebody from getting a job or making her lose the job. And I've seen that quite a bit uh, with, with some of the work that I've done. Um, and they will take paychecks, for example. One participant got uh, evicted because she would get beat uh, by her boyfriend if she didn't give him her paychecks. Um, another one, he, uh, I'll just read this quote really quick. He made me lose my job. He would call up my job. He tried to change my life insurance. Um, uh, it, to his name, I ended up losing the job after they said he was calling about my life insurance. I was thinking about it like he's going to try to kill me for my life insurance. Uh, so it's seeing those types of things. And from a medical provider standpoint, we, we need to, screening would be very helpful. But the reason, and this goes to answer kind of both of your questions, is that sometimes we don't ask the right questions. And so a lot of survivors, if you ask them straight out, are you being abused? They're gonna say no, because some people don't identify that. I had one participant who said she was not in an abusive relationship and she got punched in her stomach while she was pregnant by her boyfriend. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> I mean, that's clearly abuse, but she didn't see it like that. And so finding ways to ask them. And so uh, training medical professionals to screen for that and ask those questions and instead say, do you feel safe at home? Um, do you, you don't have a job right now. Would you like one? Are you unable to? And then kind of seeing, you know, what's the reason behind that? Uh, do, and asking about certain situations. So has your partner ever um, broken um, or destroyed one of your belongings? And that's the best way to kind of get at um, those types of things in screening. We also need to see expanded services for gender-based violence because, I mean, just, I live in a city with over a million people and we have three or four shelters, which often leads women with children being homeless. Uh, what was really interesting is that in Peru, they actually have a mobile care team. So if you're experiencing, say, domestic violence, you can actually call and they will go out and they provide mental health services. They help contact the police. They help with your children. And so kind of thinking about things outside of the box as well. So there's there are medical services there, but there's um, also a little bit more and they go on site. Also just decreasing the stigma about it. That's why a lot of people don't report is, you know, it, it's still very stigmatized. Um, and one thing um, that we could do is at medical, uh, with at medical providers is have like some sort of gender-based violence help desk and they can kind of help with referrals to anywhere, um, keep up referrals updated, do the screening as I had mentioned, um, because as you'd already said, you can't make informed decisions without the data, but if we're not asking the right questions and in the right way, we're not gonna receive that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Liesl. You, Dr. Liesl. Uh, with that, I also would like to add in Sri Lanka, we do have uh, within our medical system, a place called Metru PSA attached to uh, the local uh, public uh, health uh, service centers. And uh, there's a help desk there. And uh, in case if any of the professionals who are watching this, and also 1938 from the Ministry of Women's Affairs does provide a lot of information to women who are contacting them. We also have women in need organizations like that working with the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Women's Affairs just to make sure that you, if you have, if you are in doubt, you can do, you can uh, definitely contact uh, these. Um, um, line ministries or departments and um, since I'm quite aware of the time and we only have two minutes I would like to thank our guest speaker today uh, Dr. Liesl Nidegger for taking time and joining with us I know the time difference between US and us and it's it's uh, very late 
for her at the moment. So we are extremely grateful for joining with us and sharing your understandings in this present context and how we can further strengthen our services in Sri Lanka. So in conclusion, I would like to say that it is time for us to uh, walk the talk of leaving no one behind and uh, try to be relevant, innovative, evaluating, learning, and adapting our policies, systems, and services. And mainly, and, uh, and I know that many of you in this audience may have already done so and have experienced it as well, consciously or unconsciously, but it is the only way forward for all of us to build resilience for success within us and around us. So I would like to thank everyone.